Welcome to the Tamarin Learning Podcast, where host Dr. Kirby Ross Plock speaks with experts on many topics relevant in the ultra high net worth family wealth management space. Kirby is author of several books, including The Complete Family Office Handbook, and shares her expertise consulting with families and family offices. Kirby is also the founder of Tamarin Learning, an online wealth education platform that develops practical, foundational learning programs for beneficiaries to help them prepare for responsible stewardship of wealth. Welcome to the Tamarin Learning Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Kirby Rossbach. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at Tamarin Learning. And today we have Cindy Redu. Cindy is an amazing thought leader in the wealth and trust and governance and all things family space in Canada. And she also happens to be our chief learning officer of Canada for Tamron Learning. We are so excited to have her here today because we're digging into trust governance. It's a topic that doesn't get a lot of press, but I have to tell you, it could potentially be what makes or breaks uh, a lot of families as it relates to how they set up and pass on wealth. Cindy, welcome. It's great to be here. I love talking about trusts and trust governance. So I'm excited to be doing this podcast with you today. Fantastic. Well, Cindy has over 30 years of expertise in the legal fiduciary trust and governance experience. So we are coming to the source and the most credible, insightful, well-written um, thought leader. And so I'm just excited because again, Trust governance is not something that is widely discussed or known, but maybe you can, in a few words, summarize what exactly is trust governance? Yeah, well, just generally, I think, Kirby, that people are familiar with the concept of governance in the three circle model. So they'll have heard about business governance or family governance or owner governance, but families and their advisors honestly rarely ever think about trust governance. And Fundamentally, I think, you know, for me, a governance is just communication, decision making, and then transparency about the structures and processes that we put in place to facilitate the communication and decision making. So in the context of trusts, we just really need to think about that, uh, those processes and structures very specifically as it relates to the trust distinct from those other ownership, family and business governance structures that are put in place. And is it always assumed that you have a conversation? I mean, tell us more what you've seen working with families as it relates to trust being set up by a settler, beneficiaries are in the loop or not, and, and the role that you often come in to help play to sort things out. Yeah, I would say that um, I would call trust governance uh, with air quotes very reactive in the sense that it's it's not intentional. What tends to happen is in Canada once a year, perhaps uh, when the tax returns are being done, the accountant or lawyer will put some documents in front of the trustees. The trustees are typically mom and dad. We usually have lay trustees when we're talking about um, family trusts. Mm -hmm. So that would be a very unintentional, reactive type of governance. And where um, so where where the challenge is there is because, again, we have these trustees who are parents and relatives or maybe even sometimes advisors who aren't really well suited to be trustees uh, or sorry, um, yeah, trustees of, of trust because they don't understand trust, let alone governance. So the, um, so the opportunity really is to be much more proactive in our choice of trustees and that the, both the family and the advisor team are thinking proactively about what the opportunities are with trusts. Uh, and, and then we can establish processes. So I think of things like you know, setting up regular meetings with beneficiaries to discuss what's in the trust, uh, trust education, um, just discussions about how the trust assets will be used and tying that all in together with the bigger vision and values of the overall family wealth. So it's a huge opportunity to really intentionally use um, that trust vehicle 
to really bring to life a tremendous amount of wealth that sits in these family trusts that often just kind of sits off to the side. I can imagine that sometimes a beneficiary might have different expectations of what they're entitled to or not. And I'm sure maybe this process, if it's more intentional and proactive as you shared, could totally create a much better framework and understanding and um, guideposts. I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit more about how that proactive approach can totally shift the dynamic. Yeah, well, the biggest problem, Kirby, is that trusts really aren't discussed. It is a very under-discussed topic for trustees and beneficiaries in Canada. And, um, and so we don't really have, we haven't traditionally had these sorts of conversations uh, as advisors. And I think from, from the advisor perspective, this happens because frankly, a lot of advisors don't really understand trust. I mean, trust lawyers do, and, and the tax advisors understand the tax aspects of trust, but, but we don't have as advisors, um, conversations with the families about how we're actually going to use the trust, as I've mentioned, proactively. And so for families, I always describe it as the trusts feel like a whole lot of smoke and mirrors. They get these massive legal documents, they get put in a file cabinet, they're just like glad to have this whole process over with. And they wouldn't actually even know to ask about trust governance. Yeah. So, so we really just need to, I mean, a lot of the education, I think, and the push can come, you know, kind of, is it a push pull? I think the, the, the families can start pushing to their advisor teams and say, you know, I don't know if you're the person to talk to about this, but I really want to understand, we as a family want to understand our trust and how we can use this proactively. So I think we need to empower families to do that and not be afraid to ask those sorts of questions. And then how do you help, say, the trustees or other parties to the trust be prepared to have those conversations as well? Yeah, again, you know, a lot of disclosure is, is important. In, in Canada, um, is Canada's very different from, from the U.S., typically... Unfortunately, beneficiaries don't even know they're beneficiaries of the trust. Uh, in, in the U.S., you have a very different disclosure requirements. And in Canada, we're actually just shifting to a new um, reporting requirement that will hopefully shift the dial on that where uh, the Canada Revenue Agency is going to require disclosure of all the beneficiaries of these trusts, including things like the social insurance number and their addresses, et cetera. And oftentimes the parents aren't gonna have the social insurance numbers of adult beneficiaries anymore. So they're going to be having to disclose. It's like, if you, you know, if your mom calls you and says, well, I need your social insurance number, you're gonna go, well, why do you need my social insurance number for? Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to just see a shift in dialogue around, around trusts and when beneficiaries start asking questions and the parents go well I don't really know how to answer that question again if we can get the families talking about this and realizing that those are actually really really good questions to ask and and bring advisors online to say yeah you know, let's start having different conversations about trusts there's just a ton of opportunity to to be really proactive and intentional with, with how we're using these trusts go forward. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more. I mean, when we don't, right? So there hasn't been a culture of transparency and that's not the fault of families or advisors. It's just the law, right? So there isn't a requirement. I mean, tell us about a little bit more about what you see as the opportunity. I mean, what this could shift in terms of the nature of families working together and how they might be operationalizing or working differently than they are today. What gets you most excited about this, this paradigm shift? The, I mean, there's part of, the, part of the thing in Canada is of course our tax rules are really drive how we use trusts in Canada. And we have a tremendous amount of wealth that's sitting in trusts. And our trusts have what, what's called a deemed disposition every 21 years. And depending on what kind of assets are in the trust, that can 
trigger kind of a flurry of activity. Um, and because of sort of the time frame, we're starting to see a bunch of these trusts come up to this, um, this 21 year date, we'll call it. So what that will, um, what will result from that is potential distributions to beneficiaries that they'll go, well, what the heck is this all about? And we're, you know, we're familiar, uh, those of us on the podcast, and hopefully members of, of the audience will be familiar or come to be familiar with Jay Hughes' concept of this meteor, where, you know, beneficiaries who don't know there are beneficiaries of trust all of a sudden find out they're getting a big distribution. This can be really damaging. It can, it can really cause um, some very interesting dynamics within the family to find out all of a sudden there's all this wealth that, that is coming their way. So, Again, if we can get ahead of it and be aware of some of the, the, the tax triggers um, and some of these disclosure requirements, I think they're good opportunities to open up a conversation that we haven't had before. And then we can start diving into, you know, what, what do we really want to do with these trusts? Do we want to explore this as, as a way to have a family bank or to support philanthropy? How, does, how can we bring to life and layer this onto what we've talked about in our family charter or some of these ownership structures that we've had? Because all these things really weave together in a, in a wonderful but very complex way. And it's important to have the guidance of advisors who really get this area to help walk along with the families to, um, to really understand what they can do and how we can make this a positive experience rather than a scary one or one that causes a lot of conflict and potentially litigation. Yeah, conflict is always the hot button that families are trying to figure out how to avoid and obviously not um, escalate if there's a fear that there could be differences of opinion. And, you know, I love how you've sort of unpacked and shared the, the importance of the shift for transparency around trust governance and how families can be empowered. Um, and it sounds like there's a big education component just by virtue of the change, right, legally that's underway in Canada. I mean, tell, tell me a little bit more about how you work with families in educating and preparing, you know, particularly beneficiaries. Yeah, the education piece is huge. And it's it's actually something I'm seeing families being proactive about requesting, which is really encouraging. Um, so really the the if understanding where trusts fit in their overall structure, this is something that is really quite mysterious to many people. They don't even really understand how their structure works. And there's a lot there to unpack. Um, so we've kind of set aside that whole structure piece within the trust itself, just understanding the very basics of a trust, like what is a trust and how do they work and what's the role of somebody who's acting as a trustee and what's the role of a beneficiary. And, um, and another thing that's really important that I talk about with families a lot is what I call conflicting roles. And you'll often find people in overlapping roles that they don't even really appreciate the risks of being in those overlapping roles. Typically dad, for example, or mom and dad will be trustees. They might be owners. If there's a holding company or an operating company, they might be direct shareholders. They're also probably trustees of the trust, directors, they might be CEO or other you know, management role. Um, so you end up with all these different conflicting roles because you think about which hat, you know, we talk about which hat are you wearing and depending on which hat they're wearing, they might be wanting to make a very different decision. And so aligning those, uh, be aware, being aware of those different roles, thinking about maybe we need to actually step back from a role or make sure that we've got some independent advisors in, in the loop here, whether they're independent board members or independent trustees, these are all really great things to have, um, to be thinking about and, and looking to take uh, advantage of those, that third party lens to educate and, and facilitate and help families move forward to really use their trusts to meet, to meet their goals. 
Well, Cindy, this is incredibly helpful. I think, especially if, if families are starting to have these conversations, just to learn more about trust governance, its role, its opportunity to bring more intention and more generative dialogue uh, between parties. If there were one or two takeaways just from what you've already shared on this podcast, what would you want listeners to be reiterated with? Um, number one, education. So we, we do need to start with education so that people understand what we've just talked about, how trusts work, the roles of the various parties to the trust and the role of trust within the overall structure. So that's a big piece of it. But I think the probably the biggest and easiest takeaway is just ask questions. There is, you know, we've heard it time and again, there's no such thing as a dumb question. And you will often find advisors don't know the answers to those questions and that's okay, but make sure that you do find an advisor for your advisor team who can answer the questions that you have. That's fantastic advice. And again, Cindy, thank you so much for being our featured guest today at the Tamron Learning Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirby Roswalk, and we're signing off.